Hello everyone. This is the first in a series of videos pertaining to the history of anthropological theory. My name is Brian Weigel and the whole series is based on these four texts. The reader and the textbook primarily guide the series of lectures um, written by Paul Erickson and Liam Murphy. This video pertains to the introduction to, that, to those texts. Two other texts are also used in the creation of this series. Archaeological Theory by Matthew Johnson, and in the second video, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. The purpose of this series is to introduce students and theorists and interested uh, public to the theories that are important to the discipline. If you follow along the entire series, it will help to improve your theoretical sophistication, particularly if you read the original texts that are provided in the reader by uh, Erickson and Murphy. This, this uh, series serves as a rite of passage for new generations of anthropologists who are interested in pursuing anthropology in their career. Anthropology is a fascinating field of study that includes people from past and present, um, through, from archaeology to cultural anthropology uh, and uh, the other disciplines and subdisciplines of anthropology. All scopes of the study of humans are incorporated, which makes anthropology a very broad and eclectic discipline. You might be surprised to learn that there is no unified theory for anthropology. Um, theories provide a general orientation to a discipline and uh, the course of study within that field. Uh, so a theory can act as a guiding principle. It frames the intellectual thinking around what questions may be asked. And Theories can be difficult to identify in the present time. They're more readily identifiable with hindsight. Um, some people at the very cutting edge of theoretical thought uh, are leading the way uh, for others that come behind. So uh, anthropology in general follows the scientific methodology, uh, which was established through the Western tradition of science and um, the theories and paradigms that exist uh, help frame the questions that we ask and what is important for study at the time. The series of lectures is organized around a concept um, provided by many indigenous peoples around the world, uh, most notably the Australian Aborigines, a concept known as the songline. So a songline or a dreaming track um, is taught and handed down generation after generation, and it provides a song as a guide or a cognitive map that allowed Aborigines to pass through sometimes featureless desert terrain through interior Australia, uh, even if they had not been in that area before. So a song or story um, allows for people to navigate these territories and find their way through what is unknown or uncharted wilderness to themselves. So the purpose of this series is to help the anthropology student to determine their intellectual song line and help them navigate uh, what is otherwise a very complex uh, and broad discipline uh, centered on the study of humans. Recently, I had the pleasure of editing this article by a linguist in Alaska with the Native Alaska Language Center, Jim Carey. Uh, the paper is about Atna place names, and he details through the place names of the Atna Athabasca, Athabascan language, um, how uh, Atna would have been able to navigate through the mountainous and rugged terrains of South Central Alaska even in places they hadn't traveled before 
simply by knowing their language. So from generation to generation, uh, the embedded within their language is the geography of the terrain in which they live. So I would describe anthropology's songline, theoretical songline, more like a braided Alaskan stream than a river. There are multiple channels flowing generally in the same direction that may or may not intersect at periods um, and that flow through a broad valley, each on their own course. And this is also a history class. So the series of lectures is outlined um, through time. We'll begin with anthropology in ancient antiquity, going back to around 300 AD with the philosophers of ancient Greece and um, thinkers of the Middle Age, Middle Age thinkers of Arabia and uh, into the Renaissance through the scientific revolution, uh, positivism, Marxism, post processualism and postmodernism, uh, feminism, and so on through the 20th century up till uh, about today where we're at uh, in the present time. So it's a lengthy series um, and uh, it encompasses much of anthropology's unique characteristic of continuous self-evaluation, self-criticism, and eclectic approaches to reflecting on its own discipline and what is the purpose of the discipline uh, and where do we want it to go. You'll see that certain theorists through time become canonized as influential and they emerge over time as framing the work of their generation. Um, these form lineages of theoretical thought that become our ancestors and their work form paradigms that influence the scientists that operated around them as well as the next generation of thinkers as those paradigms shift through time. So theoretical ancestors are positioned intellectually to gain recognition, to gain following and identity for themselves and for their schools of thought. This creates the history of anthropology as a scientific discipline. So the approach of this series is for the students to think about it in terms of a dialogue with our intellectual ancestors. So like most history of anthropological theory courses, we'll talk about one or two dead guys a week. Unfortunately, often this comes in the form of dead white guys. But in this class, we will also incorporate um, the voices of women and people of color as we broaden the spectrum a bit from the traditional um, texts that we have available. I hope that you find this series thought provoking and slightly humbling. It can be a little bit intimidating to think about theory um, and to approach things from a theoretical perspective, but you can do it. Anybody can do this. It just takes a commitment to the readings and to study uh, and think about things on a higher plane than we normally otherwise would. It's also designed to nurture the respect for the study of humans from all places and corners of the earth from all backgrounds. Um, of course, anthropology as a discipline is designed to give voice to those disenfranchised people, the people without a history, as Eric Wolf put it, um, to help frame their part in the human story and our human journey as we came out of Africa. As I've mentioned, anthropology is a very broad and very deep discipline with a strong intellectual legacy, and I hope you come to appreciate it more broadly after completing this series of videos. So what is anthropological theory? Anthropological theory is wrapped around the three main systems of thought that have existed 
uh, with humanity for centuries. The first is the scientific tradition, second is humanism, and the third is religion. All three of these have contributed in ways to the discipline of anthropology because all three of them are overarching ways of seeing the world. They frame our worldviews often as individuals, and in many instances, they um, contribute to um, conflict and disagreements among people that adhere to one of these three different schools of thought. So let's review these three briefly. In science, people and God are seen as secondary to nature or the natural world in which we live. Nature encompasses both people and God. So in some examples in the science of biology, people are a collection of carbon and water. Um, we are the product of proteins and our DNA. In psychiatry, God was created by a pre-existing human intellect. You can see how there is conflict and um, disagreement between science and religion. Humanism is um, a little different in that God and nature are secondary to people. People encompass God and nature and thus are the paramount being. For humanists, humans are the measure of all things, and human nature is the central fact of our existence. For religion, nature and people are second to God, and God is paramount because it encompasses both people and nature. So we know that God created heaven and earth and then people. So these are three overarching schools of thought that form people's different worldviews, and it can be difficult to encompass all three um, in one worldview. For anthropology, throughout our history as a discipline, we have approached the study of humans through science, humanism, and through religion. So people have asked these three questions throughout their existence. Even the Paleolithic hunter-gatherers of the old world asked these fundamental questions. Where did we come from? Why do we differ? And how does our world work? For anthropology, all peoples and cultures in time and space have had their own versions of anthropology long before anthropology existed as a Western tradition of science. So this course is concerned with that historical development of anthropology as a Western science. The nature of science will serve as the framework for this series of lectures and for framing the history of our discipline. So we'll ask these questions, what are theories, how are they structured within paradigms, and how does science work to interpret the world? To do that in our next video, we'll talk about the book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. So I wanna thank all of the um, sources for my images and the four primary texts that we'll be using in this series. And I wish you all well, and we'll see you in the next video.